Hello and welcome to this BFI at Home event. I'm Isra and I'm part of Tape Collective and today I'm speaking to director Aline Khan, actors Joanna Scanlon, Natalie Richard about their latest film After Love. Hello everyone. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Very well, very good to be here. Thank you for having us. And so Aline, I want to start with you because this is such a unique story and um, the main character, Mary, is is a character that we rarely, if ever, get to see on screen. And I really am quite curious to know how the idea came about and how you developed Mary's story and the script. So I think the genesis for After Love really came from me wanting to explore something about my own feelings of feeling quite other in a, both in society and within my own family in a weird way, growing up with kind of mixed heritage, not quite knowing what my place was. And I guess also kind of how this idea of how we construct our identities, who we construct our identities around. And, and I wanted to show a Muslim character at the center of a story. We so seldom get that representation. And, you know, an older woman of certain size who wears the headscarf, we never get to see the full interior kind of spectrum of a character like this on screen. And so, I just wanted to make a film that did that. And I, I guess for me, the, the framework of Mary was really inspired by my own mother. Um, my mum is a white English Muslim convert. She married my dad in the early eighties and converted when she did. And they grew up in Walthamstow, but we were raised in Kent. And I don't know, growing up, we would hear all these stories about mum and dad and, and the challenges that they faced being in a mixed race relationship, him being Muslim, her not having a religion, and the conflict she had also within his own family. And, and I don't know, I just, in some way, this film is kind of like a, a way of honoring their story. And yeah, I wanted to, um, I wanted to have that representation. Um, I think the way that I develop the characters is, so I spent five years writing the film and I tend to, I, I write quite slowly and I, I spent a year kind of outlining a rough idea of what the story would be. And actually I kind of start from the characters and I, I kind of compile very detailed kind of dossiers on a character's kind of physiological, psychological kind of the aspects of, of, of a character. I kind of see them as kind of three dimensional characters and that's uh, as people and almost like right down to their blood type, scars they have had, surgeries they've had, all of these things help to give a character history. And ultimately, um, it's what motivates their choices. So before I can kind of move into a story, I have to really know this character. Unfortunately, I know my mum very well. So I was able to really base a lot of my mum's history and inject that into Mary. Once I've completed a kind of very kind of detailed kind of outline of, of a character and their backstory, I'm then able to kind of go on a journey with them and, and kind of write the story. And the thing, that, the thing that I love doing is putting characters I know very well in situations where we don't know how, they're, how that's going to play out. You know, that's where the drama comes from. That's where the crisis and the conflict kind of arises. So, um, yeah, it's... But it's it's a long process. Thank you. And is the result now that you've seen the film that's out? Is is the result what you'd planned, or was there quite a lot of things that were changed throughout the process? That's a that's a good question. It's a hard question. Well, it's not actually a hard question. It's an easy question in the sense that it, all the parts are always moving. At every stage, you are constantly recalibrating, and you know when you're shooting the film, things come up, new ideas come into play locations fall through, weather changes, you, know, you have to just kind of be on your feet. And that can be quite painful at times because it's like, oh, I've spent, I've spent months writing this and in a blink of an eye, you know, you have to change it. But that's just part of the process. The edit for me is the point where I feel like I have the most control of like how I can shape something. Like, you know, you're not, you don't get to choose uh, the kind of the cards that were dealt sometimes but it's kind of when you're in the edit, you, you have the time as well to really piece things together and, and you make new discoveries. So the essence of the film is absolutely there. Absolutely. And I'm very pleased with where we've all got to. Um, 
and and it's been a huge learning curve for me you know the film the, the film kind of tells you where it wants to go you know and you just kind of have to get over your yourself in some ways and and, and and trust in the process and and let it guide you um but it's a real paradox because you have to let it guide you but you also have to kind of create the pathway for it so um yeah but i'm, ve I'm very pleased i'm very pleased with how it's come out Thank you. And I mean, the film is very layered. There's so, so many layers to the film. So hearing you talk about the ideas of mixed heritage and being othered, um, I'm curious to hear about how you, Joanna and Natalie, how you, what your reaction was like when you read the script. Oh, I love the script. Uh, I found it a page turning script. It was like the, because the coordinates within it are so unusual and so fresh and so uh, you know, I don't think anybody's going to have seen anything that is as both universal and also so particular. And I think that's exactly relates to Aline's process because he's talking about his own experience and his family's experience and making that, uh, it drives so deeply into that, that it becomes kind of a universal process at the end. So that I think in the sense that it's very identifiable with uh, so I found the script itself. I love the script so much. And I think Aleem's right that even though certain things, quite substantial things altered in the edit from the script, um, the essence was always exactly the same thing. It was always exactly, uh, the heart of it was always there. Yeah, it's, it, it's a brilliant script. I hope there's a chance to actually put the script out. You know, it's, sometimes it's so interesting to, to read what um, what it started as and, and also see what it ends as at some point. Natalie? Yes, yes, uh, I agree with Johanna. And for me, it was uh, really powerful. And really, I read it like in one time. And uh, because I could, uh, I thought that all the outside, I mean, with the story and uh, with the characters, but also outside the story, you could feel every, everything and you could see all the images. I could have, I had a lot of images mm -hmm. when I was reading, which is not usual. Hmm? So I, I could feel how the movie could, where it could uh, go. And I loved also all the relation with the, you know, the sensation with this man who is all the dead, but all the time there and how he's there by, uh, by how we are met with Mary, with, uh, with the relation with, uh, with Talib, who is playing my, my young boy, but also through the clothes, all this, all the, uh, and also all the, the images with the fields who are just uh, falling. So, and you could really feel that even the places where they were, the houses, everything was related to what they are living and what they are feeling and how they have to manage a new life after the death of this man. So it was really, really powerful. I saw, and, and when I read it, I said, oh, he's a real director. Mm. Which is, which is. I I think also in that, in relation to that, it could have, you could have made this story so kitchen sink. Uh, it could have been very domestic and kitchen sink. And even in the, the script, it has so much that's poetic and cinematic and is not, is not the kind, the moments, but they're very, also very well judged as to how the extent of that and how much it, it shifts your perception for a moment or two into something that's magical or, or mysterious um, and then takes you back into plot. You know, it's a very unusual level of plot, dynamic, almost thriller element mixed with this truly cinematic poetry that opens it out into a different space in your the way the brain functions. Yeah, and I think in terms of also what you said in terms of poetic, that really makes me think of you know, a big thing at the heart of of Islam is ceremonies and rituals. Um, and Aleem, I'm quite interested in hearing in terms of how did you choose which rituals and ceremonies to include in the film? Mm. I, I've, I rarely see the kind of the rituals in Islam on screen and they're really beautiful. 
they're so they sound beautiful the movements so considered it's very kind of connecting and but it was really about wanting to to show the, the parallels in the rituals of our daily life for me mary performing wuzu which is the ablution before you pray and the actual namaz prayer is just the same as her cooking a dish they're both mm -hmm. grounded and rooted in an expression of love and making a cup of tea you know these are all things that bind us to ourselves to the people that we love to something greater than, than, than us than us so I wanted to kind of juxtapose those kind of those kind of religious and everyday kind of rituals into the film um, and but, but I just wanted to see I just wanted to see Mary praying I just wanted her to perform the Mars it's such a powerful image to see someone speak another language that's not theirs there's such a question in that and I, th I thought it would be um it would be a really interesting way of kind of expressing an idea of how we how we love in a way you all had to speak other languages as well and some alim how did you write in in three languages what was your approach to that um, I don't speak French. I don't speak Arabic. Um, I can pray in Arabic, but I don't actually speak those languages. Um, I mean, I was fortunate that Mathieu and, and the bureau of uh, the, the producers of, of the film are French. So, cult and I'm, I love French film. So culturally, I don't know, I, I feel like I understand that cinematic world, but I don't speak those languages. So I kind of wrote as if, I don't know, as if I was French, but then actually it was when Natalie and Talid came on board and we got together and we'd go through the script and it was about letting them kind of tweak the lines because obviously they know how to speak their language than, better than I do. But um, so we were able to kind of keep the essence of what the lines meant and we removed some of the lines as well. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much of a challenge really. I kind of just, because there's hardly any lines in the film like mm -hmm. so much of the storytelling is told through the cinematography uh, cinematography through the production design the sound and sound design and the music the dialogue and the performances are just one part of a much wider storytelling process so um and i when i'm writing i have very clear images in my head of composition and because they're all they're all referencing the character in a way and what the character's going through. So um, yeah, it wasn't as hard as you might think it was because I think it plays into the, the great, the kind of the language of the whole piece. And Joanne, what was that like having, again, having to speak Urdu and having to, to pray in Arabic? <laughs> uh, it's a task. Um, it's a task because the sounds are really unusual. And uh, I mean, the, the thing that I tried to, latch on to and actually don't feel I fully pay, uh, achieved is um, when Aleem does the namaz it's really it's got this kind of throwaway quality to it it's really kind of easeful um, and to make it seem as if this is something that's just been through your body and through your vocal cords again and again and again that quality that getting that is quite tricky I mean, learning the sounds was a little bit tricky, but actually there was one day when um, Talid's mum was with us and she uh, recorded it for me so I could just get the, the sounds right. And she is, what is she, Aleem? Uh, is she, where is she from? Syrian. 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 Um, so she recorded it for me. and. The way she said it had this unbelievably beautiful prayerful quality. I really found so it was trying to balance the spirituality which she brought when she when she said it for me, um, and Alim's casual way of in, sort of making it an everyday thing. Trying to bring those two together was the I felt was the task, um, and the Urdu uh, was more was was simpler because that was more of a conversation. So, but not, not to say I got it right, because we did have to do some adjustments later on, but it was, it, it, it was, uh, that felt more like a, you know, it was this, as you're talking about this sort of ceremonial ritual element that was hard to, to really place uh, in a convincing way.
Does you have anything to add? Because I loved, I absolutely loved the scene at the end where um, the French serves as a barrier for Mary and there's an, a, a complete sort of family conversation happening that Mary just can't engage in and doesn't understand. And I'm wondering what is it like sort of being able, did you enjoy the French scenes? Did you enjoy the English scenes? And what was that like? I, I love the French scenes because it went, to, uh, when Natalie and Talib were talking to each other in French, act, acting as their characters, I felt like I was inside a French film literally inside it because I was physically observing it, but I was in the room and it, and I have loved French cinema since I was, you know, first French film I would have seen Truffaut or something when I was about 15. And since then I've loved, loved, loved French cinema. So it was a, it was a thrill. And I felt like in the way that sometimes the British feel around the French, I felt this sort of clod hopping quality that the British bring in that says, oh, it doesn't have this, fluency and elegance that the French have in the way the, the conversation goes. I mean, I speak enough French to sort of understand maybe 25 to 30% of the words that are being um, spoken. So I think maybe that's what makes it neurologically interesting because you can pretend, you can, you can almost go into a pretense whilst listening to it that you understand it when you don't. And that means that you could, you're you inventing it. You're, there's an imaginative element that goes in there. Yeah, I absolutely loved that. Um, as well as feeling, you know, as Mary feels like outside, but I was, Mary's outside, but Joanna was inside something that, that felt very special. I also, what I, what I liked about the, this, the relationships between Mary, Solomon and Genevieve is like language is used to kind of include, but also exclude. And for me, it was important that both of these women had access to this boy. Mm. And for Mary, that access was through speaking Urdu, was speaking, speaking the language that his father had taught him, which is a language that Genevieve doesn't understand. So there's a kind of triangle um, that these kind of three characters are kind of working around and they they actively also try to kind of block the other one and kind of create a channel with this child and the kind of the power dynamics between these two mother figures kind of vying for this, this boy's attention and kind of affection um, I thought was important. Natalie, what was, what was your thoughts on, on that? Um... <laughs> My mother was German, so when I was a child, I spoke German and French with her, and she was uh, speaking like four languages. So it's true that uh, for me, and then I lost German, and then I spoke uh, English, and also because I went to the United States, and I have a lot of friends actually who are speaking like more than two languages, or they are coming most of the time from two countries. So for me, when I was reading the script, something very intimate was for me, like to be on two, what is to be on two countries, even if you're in one, two culture, how people are seeing this, right? Which is not actually the, uh, the same countries, but this kind of feeling, how to go and how with your son or your child, you're speaking two language, uh, a strange language, English, and then the French. It was like at house for me at home, <laughs> in a way. And in a strange way, because you don't know really where you are. Mm. So it was, um, I don't know how to say that. Mm. But, 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 I could yeah. feel what was happening between the two women and also the difficulty of the son to, to really, in this age, in this crisis of the age, and with the um, absence du père, yeah, with the father who's not there, who just pops up sometimes, and with this secret, I mean, the silence around him, how that we are talking like all this language makes something for, uh, of course, for the, uh, this young, young boy. And yeah, it's all, I mean, there's, there's one particular scene in the film where the three characters are around a table and they're speaking in different languages. Oh. And it's, it's one of the first moments in the film where the narrative point of view begins to really shift because oh. so much of the point of view is from Mary's perspective. We're with her on this journey. But in this moment, there's a shift. Mary's kind of got to a place within this family 
and a, a certain level of understanding about the relationship that this family had with her husband. And as the frame kind of begins to kind of widen and allow these other two characters into the frame, so does the narrative point of view begin, we begin to see things from Genevieve's point of view, from Solomon's point of view. We allow these characters to kind of inhabit the space almost equally with Mary as the kind of truth becomes clearer. And we've talked about, I've heard the word home mentioned quite a lot. And I think there's quite a lot of things that signal to home, whether that's language or where Mary wears a hijab or, you know, the actual physical sort of movement and travel to another country. Um, and, you know, when you mentioned sort of just us sort of thinking of borders and at one, in one scene, even there's the actual sort of physical unpacking or, you know, packing up a home. And I'm wondering what, what you think home means in terms of processing grief, especially in this film and the significance of it. Yeah, for me, it was important to show all of these characters as being in transition, in flux, on a kind of migration, like Ahmed's going to another plane, Genevieve is physically moving home, Mary is on her own internal journey through this deep grief that she's in. And Solomon is also working out, he's on the kind of cusp of adulthood and he's trying to kind of find his place. Um, for me, you mentioned borders, like the image of the cliff was something that I had from the very beginning of, of the whole process. I always knew I was gonna set the film in Dover and in Calais. And obviously I, I, I was writing the film during, the, during Brexit, during the kind of the birth of the refugee crisis in Europe and when it then presented itself in Calais and, and with the jungle. And, and it, really, it really did kind of charge the way I thought about identity, class and race and representation and, and borders and what that actual image means. And what it means really depends on what side of the border you're on. Because in the UK, the way that we look at that cliff, that structure, it's, really much, it's very much bound up in this idea of kind of an older world, kind of Winston Churchill, Second World War, white British values. But I find that very interesting. Like, what is that? Do you know what I mean? Like it's one of the things I wanted to show through the film was how kind of our ideas of fixed identities are really not fixed at all. They're constantly evolving, shifting, eroding and revealing new facades. And that structure of the White Cliffs of Dover has a very different feeling if you're standing on the shore in Calais looking across, it has a completely different meaning. And so this idea of home was really central to, the, to, to me when I was, when I was writing, it's like, what is, what is home? Like, also what is family? You know, um, how, how are families configured and the different ways that they are configured? Um, I wanted I wanted there to be a moment in the film where the audience can see a new family dyma dynamic emerging. I guess Mary leaves, you know, as soon as, as um, Ahmed has died, she, I mean, we see her house proud before that, don't we, in the home, we see, I mean, what a lovely house. I mean, it was, it was such a lovely house. <laughs> and I have a strong sense of that place and that house. And what a dream life in many ways. And I think we start off with that. Um, and the house proudness that she shows, you know, at the, ver the very beginning and so on. But as soon as Ahmed has gone, there is, what is that home? It's just a shell. It's just a thing. He's gone. And so that rootless, homeless, journey that she goes on because when she arrives in Calais she has nowhere to stay nowhere to be no, there is nothing and almost making she makes this strange pact in another person's home which is also in change so I think there is something about do which exactly what Aline just said about home and family are are they one and the same because without your family what is your home and without your home what is your family if the family has no home you know has no place to be in the world um and for me the the image of the the breaking up of of the white cliffs of dover which does you know even goes back to king lear um is in terms of englishness and and cent centrality is so much about the sort of truth that nothing is set in stone all these things that we see as stone, as set in stone, as permanent, are actually impermanent. 
even the most permanent is impermanent. And I think that's for me, this sense, and if you want change, which, you know, it's arguable that this film talks in more sociological terms, but uh, if you do want change in life, then maybe these edifices have to crumble in order for that to take place, that, that, new, that new cliff face, that new facade. But also in the same, in the way that Mary's home is very ordered, her chaos is kind of internalized. Whereas Genevieve's chaos is, it's, it's, it's in, it's, we see it more physically in her home. Her house is more tired. She is um, practically a single mother, you know, she, she's, she's raising this child pretty much on her own. And it's one of the reasons why she's moving. Like we see, I mean, we think we see, you know, the, her house kind of falling apart. Genevieve, even says like this house is falling apart, it's why I need to leave. It's kind of this idea that the foundations of these two women's lives are crumbling, one kind of metaphysically and one physically, if you know what I mean. And you know, it kind of kind of works to a point where they both kind of recognize that crumbling in each other. One of the moments I really love actually is the two boys throwing the sofa into the back of that skip thing or whatever it is. Um, that kind of, that the youth being able to let go, get rid of, move on from stuff that, you know, and enjoy that process. Whereas when you're older and you hold on really hard to, to things that you've known from the past, it, it's, very, it's very calcifying, very limiting. That's just such a lovely image for me that. Um, That's one of the differences really between Mary and Genevieve is that Genevieve, has kind of reached the end of her tether. Like she's buying this house alone. You know, she's trying to create some security for herself. She's, she's a bit more free to kind of throw, to th throw things away, but that's only because she doesn't know what she's lost, you know? Whereas mm -hmm. Mary on the other hand knows what she's lost. And so she's finding, she's desperate to kind of retain any trace of her husband in a shirt that Genevieve's just like, oh, just throw that away, you know? Mm -hmm. So we kind of meet these two women in di very different kind of spaces. And obviously that, that jeopardy that's created from Mary knowing that Ahmed's dead and working for, um, for Genevieve, obviously there's a kind of an inherent kind of tension and um, dramatic irony in that. I also quite like the fact that it's, there's something about the permission at the end in terms of, of um, Genevieve and you know actually entering the home and with permission though and that they're sort of going through the same process as, as Mary had done um, in France and you know the home videos play such an important part as well. Well just on that I think and, and Natalie jump in if you if you want but for me it was like it was really important that I mean we experienced this film primarily from Mary's point of view but it was really important for me that Genevieve and Solomon got to see the other side of the man that they've lost at the end, because the story is about these two women and this boy that they share and, and the journey that they go on in the, in the shadow of this person that they've lost in their life. And I wanted that kind of, that kind of spiral motif of you know, we see Mary going through Genevieve's things and we understand the motivation. She's trying to desperately trying to cling on to any facet of Ahmed. And I wanted, and thought it was correct that Genevieve had that, that we saw that in Genevieve too, because they did both share the same man. For me, when I was writing, it was this idea that Mary would have ironed the shirt that Ahmed put on to go to work. And in the evening, Genevieve would have been washing it and laundering it for him to then wear to go back. Mm -hmm. This kind of sharing of someone They've kind of always been in each other's lives. They've always kind of shared the shared shared each other in a way. Natalie, did you want to make a? Did you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking why, and and it's interesting that actually we never speak really about a man. How why? How could? It's not the question. How could he do this? But how it was necessary maybe for him. Mm. And, and he had to live maybe with these two parts. He's just, just really, um, in a way, he's really in each part with Mary, 
and with Genevieve. But th then at the beginning of the movie, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering, he just had a heart attack. So that's strong because how come? And like something was too much and in a way he couldn't do in another way. That's a real question of love and maybe also for these two women to accept that this man was the both, the two parts, right? And it's a real question. How come that that man was like this and that the two, long, uh, two women, they are at the end of the movie, love that man as he was and not to have some kind of discussion how he could be different or how he was good or bad. So I think it's interesting uh, how Alim um, um, uh, he are uh, going around that, that point. And if not, I was thinking also of what Joanna, you said I'm agreeing and Alim also. It's like, I think we don't, I'm not sure that we have with all the question about identities, I think we don't have one identity. It's impossible. <laughs> and as as uh, as Aliem said too, and all the impermanent impermanency. I don't I don't know. Uh, it's like it's moving all the time. It's not possible to say I'm like this or I want to see one person just in that way mm -hmm. of religion, of thoughts, of everything. It goes, and also because everybody has a part who comes from maybe another country, something strange, something that we don't know that. So I think when I'm seeing the movie, it's like it, an, a human being is very complex and has a lot of waves mm -hmm. and it goes all mm -hmm. the time to a lot of mystery places. Mm -hmm. And that is very important, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like, and also, all, and also with what you said, because the young people now they have to say, okay, and I need, like home is your body. I need to know everything was happening, but then I have to put things out or I know they're here, but then to go, they need to go with all this multiplicity of everything in the world where we are living. It's very, very important, I think. Yeah, and I think, I think it, it relates to what Alim said at the very, very beginning here, that his, this film honors his parents. Mm. So that here is this honoring of the past of, of his past and the past itself, but it's also very much an invitation to change and to accept things in a new and different way from that past. I think that that's really uh, in the film. It's, it is very unusual. That's what makes it un very unusual because it's respectful, mm -hmm. something deeply respectful in it. And yet at the same time, it, you know, it suggests let us let go, let us, let us live a new reality. Mm. And then also, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking also that actually uh, we, um, we could see that every character of the movie has two sides. Mm -hmm. And then when we are meet, we have three sides. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe with the friend of, uh, of um, Salomon, then four, because also Salomon has, uh, has a secret with the love affair with the, uh, his boyfriend. But what I want, and also when I, I really like this moment when you're praying, Johanna, but the second time, and you're crying in the same time because you know that he, he, he was with another woman, but you still say, and that's wonderful, you still say the prayer. And in the same time, you have this belief and this usual, habit to do it right with the same love but and in the same time it's like all oh, it's totally paradoxical yeah <laughs> you know like all this uh, how could it happen all this it, it's not it doesn't go with the words that i'm saying and actually maybe you don't believe in god at that time mm. but then when you're saying this yes you still do and I think that's very interesting, this moment, like, yeah. you're broken, but then the two parts, and maybe the prayer allows you to cry. Or when you cry, then you're not saying the prayer at the same place. Mm. Mm. And I think we could see that maybe 
um, because even also the scene when uh, you know the, when we are really talking the first time outside no, 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 the house I mean, in the garden, and when I'm asking you question about how did you convert, how did you also because you remain, I, I think Genevieve of uh, Ahmed, right? But it's also the same like um, she's curious, and at the same time she can think that maybe she had to do it maybe to keep Ahmed for her for for herself. And in a way, she's just discovering discovering a woman uh, without all. I mean, without because you're smoking, you're not the woman, not only the woman. That maybe we can uh, about what we have like images because you have a you have the veil, yeah. and it's like curiosity, the beginning of friendship, and maybe frightened to to be frightened to know oh what is this kind of person or because she's thinking about Ahmed's wife. Mm -hmm. So it's never, what I like also, the character is never at one point. He's never at the point that to think that he is only. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah. and with just a little bit of dialogue because it's true that the images, but you can feel all this and that it's. Yeah. But that, that duality within each character is very, it's very, the way the story develops is we think that we know these characters when we first see them. It's, it's, it's part of the commentary, I guess, the, one of the things I wanted to kind of say is like, you, we judge them, like society judges these people, mm. like just on very superficial kind of expectation. And for me, I wanted to kind of dismantle that in, in that, because when you just kind of remove that facade or you actually take a moment to have a conversation with someone who doesn't look like you, you you, re you realize that there's a very clear shared humanity. And for me, it was really important to present these two women as not kind of at each other's throats, having a massive fight. And it very clearly could go that way. I wanted to go beyond that expectation and show actually these two women develop an, a, a, something more truthful. They understand their place in the wider picture of their lives that, and the lives that they shared with this man. Because I think when you step back and you look at the whole picture, you're able to see, you're able, I think you're able to see um, the truth in things, the good in things. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's easy. It's very bittersweet, but there's a kind of an acceptance that, that these two characters find in one another. And the, the journey to that end point is them, they kind of, they kind of, they're kind of like um, mirrors of, of one another in a weird way. You know, they, they present very differently, but they're both going through a breakdown. They're both kind of struggling and they both also have strengths that the other one doesn't. And they see the kind of the opposites in each other as well. And that kind of revolves around the boy and how they both kind of together would be an incredible team because they both, um, yeah, they both kind of have the different, uh, the opposing qualities in one another. So they're kind of, as a unit, they would be very strong. Um, and, that's, and that's what makes it a kind of um, ironic in a way. And that Ahmed's death actually is what bring these, brings these, the, the, the needs and the wants of these characters are actually fulfilled by Ahmed dying in a way. The, um just in terms of the filmmaking, I think that it, it was it was very good and lucky that we filmed with Ahmed with Nasser at the beginning. And there are other scenes um, which didn't make the edit uh, with him. So Natalie and me and uh, Talid all had our scenes before we, you know, we, after everything in the story that happens after that. And I, for me, it was always incredible that time with him as a person, Nasser himself and Ahmed, yeah. therefore the character of Ahmed, was always there as in this extraordinary presence in his absence. And I think for me, that's what you're, one of the things you're saying, Aliam, is that there's those three people and they make one team and then there's this other who's not there, who is the, other, the fourth person in that um, story. And it's 
just we just I could always hold him in my mind and imagination because we shot that way. Whereas if we shot all his stuff at the end, it might have been a very different ex experience of of the loyalty and faithfulness to this person who's done some not great things. Yeah, I I, I also thought like the way that because we didn't get to shoot is where we didn't get to shoot in complete kind of chronological order. And I've done that. I prefer that way of filming, but it's a, such a luxury. And I know that obviously Joanna and Natalie will be very used to shooting out of order. Um, and it was one of the things I was afraid of actually. I mean, Ahmed is at the beginning of the film and we started shooting in Dover. So it meant Natalie and Talia coming over and shooting the end scenes of the, of the film in the, at the end of the first week. And I was terrified about that because it was like, these characters haven't gone on the journey yet. They haven't gone through this journey. So how are, we, how are they gonna find that, that connection? And I guess, I mean, the end of the film is my favorite part of, of the whole film. And I guess that's what you get when you work with very experienced and talented actors that they can find, it's got nothing to do with me. They, they can draw on other things within themselves to make that moment happen. And it was really beautiful that that day when that reunion happens, I've never cried ever. I'm not really someone that cries very often anyway, but I really cried watching that moment because it was such, there was, it just reminded me of my mum and me and my husband basically. And it just, it just really took me back to something very real and it was, so, I mean, Joanna, I think you felt it too. Like it was such a beautiful moment, wasn't it? And Natalie yeah. was there, it was, it was very strong. And, um, and I was always just, I was just very, very kind of impressed and in awe with, with all of you that you kind of could do that without having gone on that whole journey. Um, but I do think it was great having Ahmed in that first week. Cause as you say, it kind of, he's the shadow that is throughout, that kind of stretches throughout the whole film. Um, yeah, and just to, uh, I think, just to, to uh, in praise of Talid, because he, he, he surprised me at every turn. His performance, I think, is, and his presence is so beautiful. And he's not here to talk today, but he is, it's so beautiful. And when he, he just doesn't, didn't have the gap of acting. It was just like, it was just like being. And so I think that that would really shot the arrow into my heart, for sure. Well, thank you so much. It, it's it's truly an incredibly stunning film, um, and it's one of my favorites of this year. And so thank you so much for speaking to me today. Thank you, Joanna, Natalie, and Aleem, and uh, for everyone tuning in. After Love is now out in cinemas across the UK, so please go and watch it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Isra. Bye, bye, Joanna, bye, Helene. Bye, bye, bye. Natalie. Bye, Helene. See you guys. Bye now.